So Simon Wade and Ben Irvine are coming together here in Melbourne, actually in the heart of Meltham, uh, Meltham, <laughs> in Melbourne, in a beautiful place called Eltham. And what they're building is an intentional community. Now, I've heard of community, like remote, rural, intentional communities, but they're actually building one here in the heart of Melbourne. Melbourne's a gorgeous city for those tuning in. It's the home of the inspired evolution and the insane sense of community here that we already have gave birth to this vibrant, rich podcast that we have here called The Inspired Evolution. And these brothers are harnessing some of that to actually build an intentional community. So we dive deep into what is their vision for it, how they're going to manage some of the power dynamics and struggles that may come up from that. Um, what were their inspirations? What are some of their key resources in guiding them on their way through this journey? And one of my favorite topics was that we discussed how important it is to break bread together in an intentional community. So if you've ever thought about establishing an intentional community or just wondered what it might be to live outside of the normal paradigm that we now call the normal which is you know just our families of three or four you know mum and dad and the two kids um tune into this episode it's really really inspiring yeah um community has been something that consistently having interviewed so many people from so many different parts of the world on so many different topics somehow there's always this undercurrent of like how important community is for mental health and well-being, emotional health, longevity, finding your purpose, finding a sense of service. It's incredible, right? So these guys are coming together and having multiple generations of families live together here in the heart of Melbourne. I think they've said it was about 40 adults, 26 dwellings. Um, yeah, yeah, really, really intriguing. Really, really intriguing. So tune in. And as always, just a humble little request. If you're enjoying this episode, please, I'd love it if you could just give it a quick little thumbs up um, at that point where it goes, oh, gold. <laughs> when you had that moment, give us a thumbs up. Truly appreciate it. And uh, yeah, always here to stay, to inspire you to stay inspired and keep evolving. Let me know what you think about this episode in the comments below. Ciao. Welcome to the Inspired Evolution, and it is a treat to be here today. We have with us Simon Wade and Ben Irvine, two for the price of one. I'm Indian. I love a good deal. So welcome to both of you. <laughs> hey, I'm <Nice>. in. <laughs> it is such a treat. It's a good, intro. It's a good today. squeal there. <laughs> it's not a squeal it's a scream anyway okay. <laughs> we're already <set> up <laughs> <on the> wrong. <laughs> so for those tuning in ben and simon uh, yeah we i know you guys from the melbourne community it is such a pleasure to have you here today i wanted to tune in because i recently found out that you two are part of setting up establishing something really cool um here in eltham here in melbourne here in victoria and in the heart of Eltham, these two brothers are part of, now, when I asked the question, it was, are you guys setting up an intentional community? The answer was, that's a really interesting question. So I'd love to ask the question, what is it that you guys see what you're doing as? Intentional community, I think, fits it pretty well, but it's nice to sometimes qualify that for people because yeah. they can make assumptions about what that means. What does it mean to you, Ben? Uh, well, intentional and community, just like really what the words sound like, but not, but not, um, but not adding extra, um, hidden ideologies in there, uh, not complicating it with, with, uh, putting too many expectations on, on the way things should work. Maybe, um, if we could add a word in there, it's the intentional community, but also like organic community, like natural mm. community, that or the natural allowing the natural community dynamics to to come out by creating a space for it. Uh, I love that. Thank you so much. Is that similar to your sentiment, Simon, in terms of what's what's being burst out there? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's a, it's an interesting point because uh, I love I love the the concept of intentional communities. And I think it's really, I think it's a really important thing that's emerging at the moment and an important technology, you know. Um, but then at the same time, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with it as well. Uncomfortable is not the right word, but I think Ben 
made a good point, which which is that there's a distinction here, mm-hmm. which is that there is no intention for our community to be founded on an ideology. Right? Mm-hmm. There is no kind of like ideology that underpins this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I think the the term that Ben used was organic, and I and I like that as well. You know, so the the intention of the community is to um, is to build a village mm-hmm. um, where people live in community together and, and where close bonds are, um, are formed, you know. Um, and, um, but then, you know, where people are free to kind of um, have their own beliefs have their own ways of being and, and have different ways of kind of relating to that community as well. Mm. And you're fostering. So, you know, one, one I'm, I'm, I'm always at pains to say it's not a commune. <laughs> <laughs> right? because, because, you know, you mentioned co-housing. And most people don't really know what that means. And so there's an assumption there that it's, that it's some kind of commune, that it's some kind of share house or something like that. And so it's, I've got to be really clear that it, it's not a commune. Mm. It's not about an ideology. It's about living together in a village. Right. Got it. So I should probably hang out this podcast now because my secret agenda was to be your cult leader. So, <laughs> 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 so uh, yeah, thanks. But thanks for coming, guys. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, beautiful. So, yeah, I'd love to tune in because there's there's two of you here and there's how many people we're going to have in this community. I think when we when I last tuned in, it was about 60. Is that what you were inspiring? For? Um, or have I got the number? Uh, up to 40, I think. Is ah, there we go. Cool. Yep, beautiful. We're aiming for and, 26 dwellings. So, yeah, it's good to establish that we're, this is, we haven't lived in one of these before. We're yeah. kind of hoping to, to experience it, but <clears throat> following our instincts in, and our intuitions into what what we hope will be a, a wonderful way to live. Mm. But so we're, we're, we're currently a little bit further down the line than um, than we were. Uh, we're, we're, we're aiming for 26 dwellings. Yep. And it should be around 30, 35 adults for the current numbers. Um, we can talk a little bit more about you know, practically where we're at with our project, if you like. Yeah, I'd love to. Before we dive into there, I'd love to sort of tune in to both of your visions um, for what, um, like, what is it that you see as the vision for the community, Ben, and potentially after that, what you see as the vision for the community, Simon? Um, and I'm sure that there's going to be similarities, but then some differences for us to potentially just feel into, yeah, just how that comes together. Mm. So vision for the community. I actually think it, it more begins with the vision for what I was uh, wanting for myself mm-hmm. and my family. Uh, Yeah, it seems like to me that there has been a sort of a lack of of the kind of community that I would like to, to have around me for mm. yeah, in my life. Mm. I think that's part of what a lot of people feel drawn to co-housing. Why is that sense that things could be a bit more flowing? Mm-hmm. Um, things could be a bit more uh, supportive. Uh, it could, could be a bit more colourful. And less <clears throat> less lonely and uh, separated. So, so I guess my vision for this project was driven by that that sense that things could be better. And I think partly that's just instinctual. I feel like it's sometimes when I'm getting bored of cooking the same food every day, it's just mm-hmm. going, "Hey, shouldn't there be a community here to create some some vibrancy in this?" Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> other people have it, other cultures have it, but we've mm-hmm. kind of had it trained out of us a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, in more recent years, I started reading more, researching more, and started realizing actually, no, I think there are some options, there's some viable things we could do. Mm. And my visions of, for that, for for the community, have come a lot more just from that research uh, rather than rather than something that yeah that I dreamed up myself. I love that. And what were some of your um? What were some of your inspirations feeling into it? Because I got there were some Scandinavian models that you've peeked into there, Ben. 
um, what were what was at the crux of your research? There? Well, the crux of our research was that there's a there's an American architect called Charles Dart who came to uh, Australia. He's come here multiple times, but he came in about 2016, and uh, my mum was really um, taken with him, mm. um, you know, intellectually, of course, and um, it thought it was uh, his presentation at UniSA where she was um, studying her PhD at the time um, in uh, in planning and affordable housing. Uh, so she's an expert in this this kind of area as well. Mm -hmm. More, well, I hope to be an expert. She is an expert. Uh, he came and and did a presentation. I actually sent it to you. It's a great sort of hour or so introduction to the way that his experience of bringing Charles Durrett were, was the was the person who brought Danish co-housing to the states. He's mm. created about fifty. Uh, projects over there will be involved in 50 and he wrote a book about it that uh, just kind of it was the, it was the thing that that it was the biggest piece of the puzzle so far in finding that book and I started reading and went oh good this is this I can vibe with this is very practical this is something that uh, um, makes sense in it and it's not too prescriptive it's not like I've been to a lot of meetings over the years where people wanted to create something mm -hmm. and it, often it would start with, so, so what should we do? We'll buy land, I guess, and work it out from there. Mm. These, these kinds of uh, potential groups or movements would fall away pretty rapidly without uh, a sense of all of the steps that are required. So, awesome. yeah. So finding that, finding that connection there to, uh, and reading that book, watching his presentation, listening to him, I just really vibed with the guy. I think so. I, I vibed with his uh, his model. I also I just his personality too. I think mm -hmm. he's similar. He starts off sometimes in his interviews being a bit kind of stumbly and mm -hmm. scattered, which I can do, and gets really mm -hmm. focused and gets really and gets, starts to really create this great picture of what's possible. And mm -hmm. and it's from experience. Like he's done. 50 of them in the States. He lived in Denmark for uh, a decade as well. Um, so that was a, a major catalyst for us. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. Oh, amazing. Simon, does that align to like, what was your vision um, for all of this? It does. Yeah. Um, I think this whole project has, has really begun with vision, um, which, which is, I find really interesting, you know, this is yeah. the, the, the concept, you know, the, the ideas of vision and mission and purpose are really um, interesting to me. And so I love that, that this whole project has kind of started with, with a clarity of vision. And really it's been a North Star throughout the process as well as we've been kind of navigating it. When we find ourselves um, faced with, a, you know, um, a decision or, or some kind of conflict or tension or something like that, it's been really useful to just come back to the vision. You know, it's one of the first things that we wrote. We, we, we wrote down a document about, okay, what, what are we trying to create here? You know, mm -hmm. um, and so that's been really useful as a, as a kind of orienting principle. And, um, you know, I remember Ben, uh, ben and I had been talking about this, I mean, basically, Ben had been talking at me about this idea for uh, for a few years. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really interesting, you know, but never kind of felt a, a calling towards it, more of a kind of intellectual interest. And then I remember I was up in the uh, central coast, New South Wales, um, kind of uh, in a period of, of recovery right after the first lockdown in Melbourne and... Um, and I realized that I really needed to get out of Melbourne. And I went up and I stayed with some friends and I swam in the ocean in the winter and, um, and kind of recovered. You know, I came back to living in, came back to connection with nature and um, did a lot of resting and, and uh, bushwalking and that kind of stuff. And I remember so clearly being on the phone to Ben and once again he spoke about um, his interest in this idea and I just kind of checked in with myself and I was like oh yeah 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 Dave. okay I'm, I'm in I'm in mm. I, I, yes 
you know. And so we, we, we chatted about it a little bit and we were sort of talking about what the next steps might be. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we're like, well, you know, probably forming a, a circle, you know, probably forming a, a group that comes together and, and we just meet once a month, you know, mm-hmm. once a month or once a week or something like this. And this is a this is a, a a model that we've used before. So Ben and I are also interested in a, a an event, a men's gathering called Menergy, mm-hmm. which is held every year in in Victoria. And we found you know the amazing power of just coming together mm-hmm. frequently. You know you just you just put it in your calendar. You come together, even if you don't really know what you're doing. You just get together and talk about it. Mm-hmm. And as long as there's a, a kind of clarity of vision and there's a sense of mission about it, the universe it, will conspire. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, things will things will emerge, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and so and and that's, and so I checked in with myself on that. Mm-hmm. You know, do I want to enter into another project with Ben here? Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh yes, yes, definitely yes. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, it kind of began there. I think that sense of, of um, brothership with Ben was, was kind of right at the centre. But then as I started thinking about it, really the sense that longing for uh, community, that longing for an ability to live in deeper connection mm-hmm. really started to come through. And as a response to isolation, you know, like we live, we live in, in a society where isolation is kind of baked into the structure of mm. this society. You know what I mean? Everybody lives, everybody lives in their own little atomic unit, mm-hmm. their own little home, often quite disconnected from the people around them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and raising their families and going through trials and tribulations and feeling like we've got to do it all ourselves, Mm. Mm. you know. Um, And, you know, I think, and and that's certainly, you know, that's that's kind of the model that I've grown up with. And then over the last kind of five or six years, finding a connection with a bigger community and starting to really appreciate how wonderful that is, Mm. you know, And, and wanting to deepen that you know, wanting to see like, how can I bring, how can I reimagine my life to put more of that community at the center? And also how can I do that in a way that I can then invite my parents into that, you mm-hmm. know, with my parents coming into retirement and, you know, and, and that all of the isolation that can come yeah, with that. Yeah, people at the end do the way we treat our, our elders in <laughs> in this society is, yeah, yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Mm, yeah, yeah, and so that was, you know, as soon as I started thinking about, oh, I could invite my parents. My, um, I would be so happy for my parents to be living in community as they come into retirement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? And thinking about it from the point of view of my children. Yeah, you know, as my children grow up from. Yeah. Yeah. My children, you know, my children growing up and, and uh, you know, they'll be teenagers mm-hmm. by the time this project is, is completed. Mm-hmm. I want to have my beautiful friends around them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want them growing up in isolation where they've only got me and, and their mother to, to come to, you know, I want to, I want to have a community of beautiful people around them. Mm-hmm. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, yeah, feeling into, what both of you have shared, I think the the essence of, yeah, I think it's really interesting just the, and I think I shared this with you, you know, like you asked me what was the inspiration of, of um, you know, having this conversation with you guys today. It's been quite remarkable feeling into all the disparate sort of types of podcasting conversations, with all these different people that I've had. And somehow there's this recurring theme and I can't say it's in hundred percent of the episodes, but it's in at least 30% of them. And sometimes it's for mental health. Sometimes it's for productivity. Sometimes it's for, you know, like just all these different types of sorts of things. And it's like, it comes back to this essence of community. And it's like, wait, like mm. what is going on there? Like longevity community. <laughs> right. And it's just like, how is it such that, you know, this thing that is at the heart of so many things is so 
yeah, it just seems a little bit more foreign than it once was in today's day and age, I guess. I think the online version of us, like, you know, there's, there's plenty of opportunities to connect online and maybe we get some level of um, that experience and we get those needs somewhat met. But I think it's quite different to when you can actually touch someone's face or hug them, <laughs> you know. There's just that, there's that palpable sort of difference. And I think co-living, like actually living with people is quite the um yeah is quite the extent of community i think it's quite remarkable that your families are coming to join you um not least because of um what you just described there simon as well um yeah just the the essence of yeah just what ends up for a lot of our our wisdom keepers our elders you know um they end up in these isolated rooms in nursing homes and you know people basically come to see them if you know once a week sort of thing and that's quite a a tragedy in my humble opinion um yeah I wanted to feel into from there um how like maybe and maybe um the gentleman from the states Drew has uh, has has an idea around this but how do you guys intend to there's no light way of putting this but uh like and I know that it's, it's going to be very organic but how do you intend to power share? Because there's going to be the dynamic of so many different people invested in a community. How does that, like, is there a model? Is there a thinking? Is there an, like, is there a, how do you navigate something like that without, without an ideology? I'd be really happy to, to speak to that. Um, ben? Yeah, you, you could speak to that and I could, um, Let's both take a run at it. Look at you two power sharing already. (laughs) 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 Pardon me, please. Go, Simon. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that I just find so fascinating about this Um, uh, is the sort of area of, you know, governance is is a bit of a clumsy term because it's not, doesn't really refer to what it is that we, that we see when we look at this, but that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And one of the really central pieces here for me is the concept of a circle, right? Mm-hmm. And the concept of a sharing circle mm-hmm. really is kind of right at the center of this, you know, and also eating together as well, kind of right at the center of how, how we intend to do this. So just very briefly, the, at, at a super high level, the model is everybody's got their own private home, Mm -hmm. just like a housing development that I'm living in in Footscray here, Mm -hmm. right? Like rows of townhouses Mm -hmm. that are owned privately by individuals, right? Mm -hmm. The difference is that we also have shared facilities, right? So the the grounds, the the yard and the grounds are shared facilities. And yeah, and and there's and then there's a common house as well, which similarly is a shared uh, a shared facility. Mm-hmm. And the cent- one of the central insights of the Danish model is that people eat together, mm-hmm. right? So you've all got your own private homes. You come and go as you please. If you don't feel like eating together, that's fine. You can eat in your own home. You've got, you got your kitchen there. But in, in general, you're encouraged to eat together. And, and the, the experience with the Danish model and with the Dharat model is that eating together is the critical factor, right? That's mm-hmm. the thing that provides the, the community cohesion Right and provides the the um, uh, the relationality within the community. Right, mm-hmm. it, it sort of allows the the relational space within the community to be healthy and to be continuously nourished. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, those things and putting sharing circles at the centre of a lot of the deliberation, a lot of the deliberative practices. Mm-hmm. Um, we intend to have sharing circles at the center of that. Mm-hmm. And, and so that for me is, is critical. Like this is critical technology for how it is that we want this to work. Mm-hmm. So for example, at the moment, we're still in formation, but every time we've had a founding circle from the beginning, um, you know, which is the, the group of people who come together, we're meeting every week to try to make this happen. Mm-hmm. And every single meeting, we've begun with the sharing circle, mm-hmm. you know. And even, even when we were real busy, you know, we had lots on the agenda, we always came together and begun with a share. Mm-hmm. And I think that's critical. I think that's a really critical part because what happens is it allows everybody to kind of come into a resonant 
space together. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of an opportunity for a we space to kind of be created and for people to come into harmonious relationship with each other at the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, and time and time again, I've come away going, wow, that was, there was some difficult topics there. There was some challenging things and, or, you know, I came into that meeting feeling a particular way and I didn't know if I was going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then being able to sit and share and say, I'm actually feeling conflicted at the moment. You know, I'm feeling this tension and I'm, I'm worried about this thing and having the people in that space sit in noble silence and hold space for that Mm -hmm. has been really critical. You know, so so that for me is right at the center. There's there's some other stuff which I'm which I could speak about around uh, governance agreements and self management, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. but but for me that re- relational space I think is is kind of at the center. But I've been talking for a while, so I might let Ben talk. Thanks, Dan. Mm. No, everything that Simon said. Yeah, really agree with and and that yeah this idea we brought this idea of sharing from this other project we worked on Menergy that that was a changing experience to to learn what it is to just have a sharing circle mm-hmm. um, to learn how to listen to each other and and to come into a sense of um, I hear this word kicking around uh, co-regulation it can can happen better when people kind of clear out the clear everything out before before a meeting um you know, i guess but and then when it comes to so the original question was around power dynamics mm-hmm. and i one of the things that really struck me from the reading the the Dart book and i think he has a really good grasp on how community dynamics have worked and what's mm-hmm. what's made them work is that uh, that there is a, a kind of an innate ability or an instinct towards community dynamics that kind of will come out, and he he raises uh, the idea of consensus, mm-hmm. and consensus in at different stages of my life has been a bit of a a big pain in the ass. <laughs> come to consensus in certain projects, and yeah. it can be a way it can get really bog things down. Uh Uh, and yet uh, in this context of people living, particularly people living together long-term where this is now your village and you're going to be there potentially Mm -hmm. till you die and your future generations will live on there, that suddenly the consensus makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. If you, uh, if you can't come to come to consensus or if you, you know, if there's, if you're making a decision between having a vote on, mm-hmm. on something which is challenging or coming to consensus. Well, there's more opportunity in coming to a consensus because there's people that can be brought into a, a, a deeper um, sense of, of shared decision-making rather mm-hmm. than overruling people with a vote. And that's difficult when, <clears throat> when so much of what we do is, you know, workplace um, decision-making, share house decision-making, it's still, it's, it's, there's relationships there, but they're not quite as long term. So mm. I feel like, yeah, that's that's a big part of what's what I'm drawn to in this project is is having well, you know, it relates to the ideology ideology too, is I don't want to have an ideology on, on how things should should work. I want mm. the community dynamics to decide that for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in the, at this stage, we're doing a lot of structure and creating a space. But I, I'm already feeling shift because that's that's kind of at the stage we're in it with this project that that a lot of that founding work has been done and we're moving into a different phase where the community is really starting to activate and mm-hmm. it's great stepping back and watching that happen. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what you're up to now, Ben. Um, where what where have you been and where where are you up to and where are you going? So in terms of the stages of this. Stages. Well, the first stage was me. <clears throat> researching and I remember thinking really clearly before I wanted to really try to recruit people and share it is I wanted to have a a pretty good practical plan of how to move forward. Mm. Some of the final chapters of that book, uh, the creating co-housing by Charles Durrett third edition 
uh, in the final chapters, he talks about the most successful, the most, you know, the easiest path to, to getting one of these projects up is partnering with uh, usually a developer, mm-hmm. someone who's really experienced in creating similar, they don't have to have done co-housing before, but that if they, if they have created a similar sized uh, construction development project, oh. mm-hmm. then it, it gives you a lot more of a, of a sense of how to move through it and you don't have to become an expert. So that's what we've been working on. Especially just before Simon got his full body. Yes. And that was, a, that was a huge step too. Um, I had come across a group in Melbourne called property collectives and mm-hmm. they're development managers. So they're not developers. What they'd been doing for the last 10 years is, uh, empowering groups to become their own developers mm-hmm. by managing all of the, the, com- the complexity of constructing and designing, um, doing all the, the council approvals that are required. Mm. Uh, it's a very complex process. Yeah. And they, and they were keen and they, they actually, actually had a, a similar co-housing project, which they, they'd, uh, launched about a year before. Um, mm-hmm. they tried to launch that, that, that group, um, is on hold now cause they didn't get the land that they were looking at. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so that felt like a big step is, is having a clear understanding of who to partner with in our professional team. Mm-hmm. And we've been working with, with property collectives for over a year and yeah, it was about six months ago that this great site in Elton came up and, and I think we've quite lucky it came up really early and it, <laughs> quite and, lucky like dude you're in the yeah. heart of Melton. what the shit sorry part of yeah. my French <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah and, nice and the, the time the timing was uncanny as well you know it was really like okay well you know we probably should start looking for a piece of land now you know yeah. <laughs> well, how about this one oh, that's perfect <laughs> <laughs> Uh, does that serendipity? Does that serendipity sort of indicate to both of you that you're on the right path, doing the right thing? Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we've had as concerns about the property, but they seem to have slowly been ironed out, and we just got this sense of, uh, well, definitely this year. I've, I keep getting the sense that you know now this project is is definitely bigger than me, and I'm happy to mm. just be sometimes a passenger in it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, yeah. I mean, in in terms of stages, I think there, there's there's a, there is a critical shift that took place a little while ago, maybe two months ago, mm-hmm. where I remember being on a call with Ben, and we're like, something shifted here. Mm. I'm not pushing anymore. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not. We're not supplying the energy now. We're now we're holding on. Mm. Yeah, it's, had its, it's got its own momentum now. Mm-hmm. But where we're at is that we've signed a contract on that property, this property mm-hmm. in Elton, it's a beautiful place. Uh, um, we've got we've got a feasibility study done. It. We've seen how you know, how it looks with uh, apartments for most of the dwellings, and but I think originally we might have preferred townhouses, but that's you know that's a compromise I'm happy to make. And, and another big thing which is happening, it's not 100% locked in, is that we are getting very good signs from a, a, a part, potential partner. I think more than potential now. That like we're working with a, with a housing uh, not-for-profit, you know, Victorian housing not-for-profit, which is going to help to support some of our members into, into the project. Not not yeah. by subsidising them, but helping them with different financial um, instruments. I guess you call them to to help people into uh, getting over some of the humps that are required in terms of upfront capital that's required. Uh, mm-hmm. Often things that block people from getting into housing and activating this sort of stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, how come um, <clears throat> I, I, Elton's a dream? Um, it's actually quite, when you think about Melbourne and, you know, outer suburbs of Melbourne and the suburbs of Melbourne, it's actually quite a beautiful place to be. Um, mm. It's actually one of the most beautiful places to be in Melbourne. Um, uh, was there ever, like, you, you, did you ever think about, like, 
going out further, having more land and changing up the dynamics? Or was it was being central in Melbourne still quite important to everybody to maintain the current lifestyle that everybody lives as well? Like what was the what were some of the deciding factors in terms of obviously the universe presented something very timely and very perfect. So maybe it was just like it landed in your lap, but was there a little bit of um, intentionality behind the location? Oh, the, I think the first dream was to be uh, on land just outside of, I guess the, the, the urban boundary of Melbourne mm-hmm. and and it, and it was interesting because it didn't take that long after researching to realize that that's not something that you can easily do. Mm. You can't just buy a property and start putting townhouses on it. Mm-hmm. It needs to be zoned for that. And, yep. and there's a lot of beautiful properties, but um, you can't, yeah, you're very much not going to get approval to build um, multi-residential structures on there. Mm-hmm. So it needs to be, what we realized is it needs to be within the, the Melbourne urban growth boundary, <clears throat> which, which councils use to help design zoning. Mm-hmm. And so that urban growth boundary um, in the area we were looking covered the whole area, the council of Nillum, Nillum Buck. Uh, there were other areas we were looking at like Diamond Creek. Um, I'm trying to think of the names. Kangaroo Ground, Warren Dyett. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting though that uh, that when this property came up in Eltham, it was, it was, we very much wanted to still feel like we're in Melbourne though, rather than mm. being a satellite of Melbourne so that people yeah. could, could tap into the vibrancy and the culture of Melbourne. I mm-hmm. want that. I don't want to sort of lose connection to Melbourne. And then this site came up and it was like very much in the, as close within the area we're looking at, it was about as close as, uh, could be to to actual Melbourne. Mm, mm. Fascinating. I love that. You mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, Simon, about agreements. Um, and I remember tuning into something you shared about, you know, the agreements that we hold in place um, consciously for, you know, some time, or maybe it was you, Ben, uh, will dissolve and just become second nature over time, you're hoping. And that down the track, you know, more agreements will be placed. Um, and <clears throat> it was interesting to feel into the essence of which you guys were talking about agreements because it was, it didn't feel very like lock and key heavy. It was just like this, you know, like an understanding that, you know, you hold as an intention for some time and then that becomes part of your DNA and because it works. Um, and then, you know, you evolve and then you can, you know, have the capacity to, you um, to do to do more with that and the word that really sat for me when you guys were were discussing agreements between each other was this this idea of really just respect um is what i really heard what are your what's your interpretation on uh, on ingre- on agreements there Simon? yeah i think this is such a fascinating area and i think this is really for me this is like right at the forefront of what's emerging in society at the moment you know is the I'm really interested in the conversations that are happening around game B, you know, so uh, game B is like, if the civilization that we have now is game A, right? Yeah, with all of its with all of its wonders and its horrors, right? And, and, you know, observing that game A is likely self terminating, right? Mm. What comes next? What what is the what is the thing that comes next, you know, and so that that's a really interesting movement for me. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is that it's likely to be more decentralised mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and it's likely to be more bottom-up. Mm. Right? So it's going to be less top-down hierarchies of command and control mm-hmm. and much more bottom-up decision-making, decentralised sensing and, and acting. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so a lot of the thinking that I'm bringing to this project, to the, to the community, actually comes from like you know that sort of philosophy and also from what we're seeing emerging in business as well you know so um for example there's this whole fascinating movement around self-management right Mm -hmm. which is basically businesses that that don't have a hierarchy 
So the whole, you know, there's, there's various different models of this, but essentially they have, they have common elements, right? And, you know, one is that everybody's empowered to make any decision. Mm -hmm. It's usually, it's usually tempered with what they call the advice process, mm -hmm. which is where you, you're allowed to make any decision, but the expectation is that um, you will consult and seek the advice of anybody who's affected by that decision. Right? Mm -hmm. So if that decision affects your team, you got to consult with your team. Mm -hmm. If that affects the whole company, you probably got to go and speak to the, the head of the company. You probably got to find a way of doing a sort of deliberative sense-making with the whole company and, and all this kind of stuff. But ultimately everybody's empowered to, to do this, to, to make any decision, mm -hmm. um, which sounds crazy. You know, I mean, coming from the paradigm that we're used to, we're like, that just sounds like mayhem. Yeah. You know? Anarchy. <laughs> Anarchy, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, surely that would just devolve into chaos, right? Yeah. Well, it turns out it doesn't, right? Now, there, there are preconditions for that. So another one is the evolutionary purpose, right? So every company that in, that's been the case study for this, they've had a sense of purpose and a sense of that purpose being greater than the, the company itself, right? So there's this sort of evolutionary purpose element to it. And I think there's some other sort of critical factors, but, but this is really interesting to me, you know, and there's um, one of the ideas in this space is called holacracy as well, which is sort of a, quite a, a structured way of a set of processes and structures to, to do self-management. Um, and so all of this is really fascinating to me from a business point of view. And I'm really interested to understand what these kind of concepts would look like in a community point of view as well. So I really like the idea of having a community where people are empowered to do things, you know, with the, they're empowered to act with autonomy, autonomy and responsibility, you know, so you have autonomy to, to, to do things and you also have responsibility for the, for the, the uh, effects of the, the things that you choose to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, wanting to really embrace bottom-up decision-making, decentralized sense-making, you know, so the idea that anybody could be like, I'm interested in this crazy thing. I'm gonna get some other people. We're gonna form a circle and we're gonna do that crazy thing. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to ask anybody's permission to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we do need to engage with the people who are affected by that. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting one because in a community, most people are affected by most things, mm -hmm. right? So how do we, how do we support that? How do we help people to feel that sense of autonomy, that sense mm -hmm. of empowerment mm -hmm. in a way that also supports them to engage and to be considerate of, of the wishes of others as well. Mm, and it does run the risk of sounding a bit formal when you describe it that way. But in the back of my head, what I'm visualizing is you're breaking bread together most nights anyway, <laughs> you know? That's it. So, you know, you're sort of sitting around and shooting the shit at the dinner table. And, yep. you know, these things are naturally going to be discussed as part of what comes up. Um, I grew up in a restaurant, so I'm very partial to this idea of, growing up around sharing community around food <laughs> it's mm. uh yeah it definitely uh is a is a thing that in my life um yeah it was very blessed with a lot of community in my life thanks to my parents owning a restaurant um but yeah i i really see the the power of just that the the softness of um that container you know just the dinner table um and just mm. the community space that you guys have and and just what that affords in terms of some of these yeah like if you know a bunch of people have a random idea to grow a veggie patch, let's just say, um, in a certain point, you know, it's like those ideas and even just the potential of what ideas will be birthed um, around the dinner table as well. So, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really beautiful to feel into that. Yeah, so I want to tune in to, um, at the heart of it, um, before I let both of you go, and we've, we've been dancing around this and we've answered it in a few different ways today, but... I'd love to hear um, from both of you in terms of why is community specifically so important for you? Is it a wellness agenda? Is it a longevity agenda? Is it um, just not having to go out to nightclubs to make friends anymore <laughs> agenda? Like, well, what's, um, what is at the heart of it? Um, is it? Is it wellness for both of you? Is it, is it family? 
um, what's at the like in a word what would you what would you describe um, the importance of community for you specifically as um, and then maybe potentially elaborating on that a little bit for us um, happy to start with do you want to go first Ben sure yeah I mean we're, I like things like just thriving you know communities just feels like the thing that we're needing to learn how to do again after mm. um Yes. After being in this modern world for such a long time, uh, mm. the, the more independent, individual-driven uh, world of <clears throat> you know getting what you need, in, yeah, by yourself. I feel like it's you know the, uh, the you know the the idea of sense making that Simon just touched on uh, just feels like a, it's the, it's what's next for us. Learning how to harmonise because the problems that we're facing, whether they're individual or uh, global or whatever scale they're a bit too much for one person to handle mm. so we have to work out ways to come into into harmony with each other mm -hmm. and yeah it feels like this is one one more piece of that puzzle mm. I love that Simon for you yeah it's I think it's a, it's a great question um and what does community mean for me? I mean, it means everything. You know, if, if I if I sort of unpack that a little bit, I, it, what I hear there is is about um, what I see there is about relationality. You know, like how how do I live in relationship to others and to the world? Mm -hmm. And in a way, what I'm learning is that I live only in relationship to others and in, and the world. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. That, that who I am actually exists in that space of relationality, you know. And I love the, um, I've recently I've been really enjoying the work of another Melbourne man, uh, Tyson Junker Porter, mm. um, who's an Indigenous Australian man, and um, wrote a wonderful book called Sand Talk, mm. um, which is about Indigenous knowledge and indigenous ways of knowing for uh, a modern world you know mm. and um man we could do a whole episode just on this the stuff that i've been learning from tyson yuka but uh, but anyway one thing that he talks about is is this um uh this this idea of beautifying the relational space in which you live you know mm. um yeah, and, and recognising that who I am is a being that lives in relationship, mm -hmm. right? I live in relationship with the earth on which I stand. I live in relationship with my family and my friends and all of my loved ones. And who I am kind of exists in that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so community for me is about really acknowledging that and really embracing that and elevating that you know, and, and seeking to really uh, live in a way that does beautify that relational space in which I live mm. um, and to be supported by, by the, the uh, environment, supported by the people that I live with mm -hmm. and for my children, you know, for my children and my family, for, for, for them to grow up with a sense of um, that, that we're doing it together, mm. you know, in a way that I didn't really have growing up, you know, like I grew up, I grew up with, with an atomic family and with a set of friends and I was well supported, but I never had the sense of having a village around me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and so I think this is important, mm -hmm. you know, I think this is really important. Um, like Ben said, you know, it feels like this is, this is what we're being invited to learn at the moment to to relearn to remember how to live in deeper relationship with with each other and with the world mm -hmm. yeah perfect i love that hmm. gentlemen thank you so much for your time your energy your abundance of wisdom and just honestly just yeah your hearts really um just to be able to follow your hearts um i, I get the sense that uh ben has been persistent uh, um in the endeavor of being a warrior of the heart in this space um to really really try and 
yeah, just band together um, with that amazing sense of community around a vision that, you know, um, saw was possible. And I think he's really blessed to have community around him, such as yourself, Simon, and as a brother of yours. I think this is just really an honour of mine to be able to share this um, with people here today, just so that they can feel into that, you know, the nuclear families that we live in, um, you know, a lot of good has come of it. But, you know, there is a lot of challenges to it as well. Um, if I can sort of steal some airtime from both of you, I um, literally had a baby. Um, literally, I don't know why I said that word. But anyway, <laughs> I had a baby two weeks ago. Um, literally, my wife actually had it. But anyway, we won't go there. <laughs> Such wood. And uh, it's just been really remarkable. Um, like a sense of community has always been present at the Inspired Evolution. You know, we've got the Facebook group, which is the Inspired Evolution Tribe, and people are often sharing, you know, like things that are really deep and vulnerable in that space. And it's an honor to just, you know, be part of this community, um, really. And, you know, as I had my, as my son has come into this world, it's, you know, even just the, the thought of, oh, in our culture, we don't have godparents. Um, but growing up in a Western society, we were like, you know what, actually, we should probably just, you know, feel into this idea of godparents, because God forbid, should anything happen to us, who's going to be around to support, you know, this blessed being that is our son, Touchwood. And then further than that, like we've actually spent the last, um, you know, few months and we have the intention for the next, you know, another three to six months to be actually living um, with my wife's parents where, you know, we've moved in um, just, and, you know, we've, we've bought our own home and it's sitting there waiting for us, but we've, we're intentionally living, you know, multi-generationally through this period. And, you know, it's been interesting um, to, to be, to, you know, to be transparent about it, but it's also been such a blessing because, you know, it takes, mm. it takes a village to raise a kid. It takes a village for so many things. Um, and realizing just, you know, like, you know, someone can leave the dishes and someone else will do them, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, and some days you do all the dishes and someday someone else will pick up your dishes for you. And you think it's, you know, going to be like people stepping on each other's toes, but over time, like you definitely figure it out and there's so much beauty in it. There's so much beauty in it. And even just the opportunity that my wife gets an extra couple of hours of sleep at this really challenging time for her because, mm. you know, her sister's around, her mother's around, her father's around, you know. Um, it's just really beautiful to feel into potentially what that on steroids <laughs> can look like at your end in what you guys are birthing and seeding together there. So it's an absolute honour um, to be able to share and inspire potentially those that are tuning into this episode to just feel into what it may look like um yeah you know living life differently um and living with community um as you shared simon at the center um of your life mm. thank you brother so much for doing this today mm. thanks for having us Amrit. thank you i'm really lovely to chat to you Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave us a comment. And if you want to stay in tune for new episodes launching every Monday, hit subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Stay inspired to evolve.